This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three. The top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of November 7th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain why our original high hopes for this election cycle have been lessened. Second, we ponder whether a Dunleavy second term will be focused on building a legacy or looking ahead to the U.S. Senate election six years down the road. And third, we explain why the AKLNG project is in a different and potentially more successful place than before. And now, let's join Michael. We've got uh, three big things we're going to talk about today. Uh, Brad... I, I already feel bad today, so I know you're about to beat me down here. <laughs> I know today is going to be you got some you got some tough subjects today, and so we're going to start off first with what uh, your you know what your fear is, um, or your conclusion on the election itself. And uh, I mean, this is not. Uh, I guess it's not good news. Let me just let me put it that way. Give me your give me give me your thoughts, Brad. Don't beat on me too hard. I feel way too bad for that. Just just do what you need to do here. <laughs> well, Michael, I think we started this election cycle. At least I started this election cycle with high hopes that we would have a good discussion on fiscal issues and other issues, but have a good discussion on fiscal issues. Um, candidates would take clear positions. And people are probably already chuckling. Candidates would take clear positions. People would understand the issues and people would vote uh, based upon uh, their view of which candidate uh, uh, best represented their position on, 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 again, on fiscal issues. And we would go into the next legislature uh, with, a, with a clear mandate one way or the other to finally get this fiscal issue uh, resolved. Um, I, it's been anything but that <laughs> during, this, during this campaign cycle. We've had people taking uh, contrary positions. Uh, the Democrats, Chris Tuck, uh, had a, had a tweet storm last night in favor of Les Guerra. And it just, it, it, you read it and you just go, what? Here, here's where it starts with the phrase. It's the economy stupid. Jim Carville successfully summarized the importance of electing people who advocate for policies that will improve the lives of ordinary people. Many of whom live paycheck to paycheck. When I look back on the last 20 years in Alaska, I don't see a lot of policies that make things better for the little guy. Instead, I see continued subsidies for highly profitable oil companies and over-reliance on the permanent fund to subsidize state government. Instead of an economy that benefits all Alaskans, I see an economy that benefits bankers, lawyers, politicians, speculators, and CEOs. I don't think many of them are interested in change. Instead, they prefer more of the same. That's why I'm supporting less Guerra for governor. Well, Les Guerra has taken a position of cutting the PFD. So of I mean, taking the PFD and spending it. Yeah. I mean, I'm what? I mean, what? I mean, so you've got you've got all this sort of inconsistency going on all over the place. You've got Democrats here saying, I'm for the little guy, I'm for working Alaska families. Maxine Dilbert is is just is just driving me crazy up in up in Fairbanks. It's one ad after another, or one tweet after another. I'm for working in Alaska families. I'm for you know K through 12 education. I'm for for a strong university system. If I get in there, I'm going to support all those things. How are you going to pay for it? Silence. Or you know the less care favorite. I'm going to tax the oil companies. Well, 
Les Garrett believes in taxing the oil companies, but he also believes in cutting the PFD. So it's it, it, there's just this huge inconsistency going on on the Democrat side. Uh, I'm for the little guy. I'm for working Alaska families, but I'm going to cut your PFD because I want government knows better how to spend the money than 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 the little guys do. I know better how right. to take take care of them than they know how to take care of themselves. Right. And on the Republican side, we've got we've got these this this group of Republicans who are saying I'm a staunch fiscal conservative. I'm for somebody who's going to stand up and you know and 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 live up to uh, uh, fiscal conservative principles. Um, and I'm going to do that by uh, voting for an affordable PFD or a reasonable PFD. In other words, I'm going to take as much of your PFD as I need to pay off <laughs> to, to to pay for this government that I that I that I don't like. I'm not going to stand up for fiscal principles that that say we shouldn't tax middle and lower income Alaska families. I'm going to stand up for principles that say say we should right. tax mo- lower and middle income income Alaska families. So I think I think we're going to end up with a legislature that's going to be. I don't know if it's going to be exactly a third, a third, a third, but it's going to be a third Republicans like Shelley Hughes, and Mike Shower, who say, and, 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 and others who say, Mia Costello, that, that we ought to support the PFD. We ought to, we ought to live up to the statutory PFD, that they're ready to compromise. If they can lock in, lock in a PFD through a constitutional amendment, they're ready even to talk about moderate taxes, broad-based taxes, if they can lock in a moderate PFD, um, but but they're going to stand up first and foremost for a PFD. And then you've got these, what I will call round heel Republicans, because they're rocking back on their heels about what the PFD ought to be to, you know, reasonable PFD. You've got these round heel Republicans who are, who are, you know, saying I'm sort of for the PFD, except I'm not really not. I, I want to pay for government. I don't want to, I don't want anybody else to pay for it other than lower and middle income Alaska families. I don't want oil companies to pay for it. I don't want the top 20% to pay for it. So we'll just do it through, through PFD cuts, but I'm a rock rib conservative Republican. I, I don't know how they get that, but, but there's, but there's that, there's that. Crunch. You keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Right. <laughs> and you got Will Staff up in, in Fairbanks and, and, and you got Forrest Wolf in, in Anchorage and you got uh, uh, Justin Ruffridge down in, in, in on the Kenai. You got, you got candidates that are like that round heel Republicans. Then you got Democrats who talk a good game about worrying about middle and lower income Alaska families. And then you, you do what Tuck does. I mean, you, you, you back candidates. He's backing Andy Josephson, who makes no, doesn't even try to hide the fact he's ready to cut the PFD to do whatever it takes to, to create money for, uh, for Alaska government and to, and to support spending. You got people like Chris Tuck who talk a good game, but then, you know, when push comes to shove, they back candidates who are, who are going off in an entirely different direction. So I, we don't, we're not going to have clarity um, out of this election. We're going to have the same three coalitions or the same three aggregations of, of politicians that we had uh, that we had before. Uh, con- fiscal conservatives who believe in the PFD, who believe that uh, that we need to solve that issue. Round heel Republicans who are rocking back and forth and don't know really what they believe, except except they don't want to tax the top twenty percent and they don't want to tax all companies. We know that. And then Democrats who talk a good game, but but when push comes to shove, they're just taking the they're taking the PFD. Also, there's there's a couple of articles about what does this mean once the election's over? How does that translate uh, into uh, into the legislature? Uh, there's an, there are articles in Alaska Public Media, both on the Senate side and on the House side, interviews of James Brooks uh, on both sides that say, you know, a coalition's possible in both the House and in the Senate. And if you look at the numbers in the Senate, if you elect people like Giesel, uh, uh, you're going to, you may end up with a, with a coalition in the Senate uh, also. And that coalition, they're, they're not going to, they're not going to try to solve anything. They're just going to try to, you know, keep cutting the PFD and saying they're, they're good fiscal conservatives, but we're going to keep cutting the PFD. And then uh, it's going to be up to the governor uh, uh, to hold the line. So it's the same standoff um, assuming Dunlake is reelected, it's the same standoff that uh, that we've had the past uh, the past several years. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure what we've gained by this election cycle. We may be changing some of the players. Uh, we may have some of the old players coming back, like Giesel. Uh, hopefully not, but we may be have having some of the old players coming back. Um, and uh, and I'm not sure what we what we've really accomplished. I I, I took to a degree 
I lay the blame on this at Dunleavy's feet. Um, he didn't go out and campaign uh, for candidates that would back him up. I mean, he was just sort of in it for himself. And, and that's, you know, that's understandable. You want to get yourself reelected first. But he was sort of in it for himself. He sort of ran a campaign that was all focused on getting himself reelected. Uh, didn't really use any political capital that he had, I, that I perceived, to get out there and push candidates that uh, that have backed him up in the past or that, that are necessary to give him a, jo- a majority to work with in the future. Um, and so we're going to, we're going to end up, I'm afraid, um, uh, this is the fear part. We're going to end up, I'm afraid in the same place we started with mush, uh, well, with, with a legislature, a legislature that isn't going to, isn't going to produce any results other than, you know, temporary year to year, uh, right. fixes. Well, and what did Dunleavy have to lose? I mean, especially some of these races, like example, the, the uh, Kathy Geisel and Roger Holland race. I mean, Kathy Geisel is never going to be his friend. She wants him to crash and burn. So he could have endorsed Holland and had all that, you know, given that support. Uh, same thing, I think, on the Shower Massey race. There are several races out there where he could have been, uh, you know, really with no danger to him. It wasn't like he was alienating people who were going to work with him in the beginning anyway. Well, I think his pollster uh, and and his advisors told him uh, that it was his race to lose. His his race was his race to lose, and um, and he just ought to hang back and uh, and and not do anything that uh, that 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 excited people or gave any, anybody a tripwire to to use against him. And you know that's a strategy, but but is it a strategy? We'll talk about this in the next segment. Segment, but is it a strategy that 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 governs? Is it a strategy that gives you policies that really move Alaska forward? Or is it just, you know, just sort of the same old, same old? We're going to rock along for yet another legislature, assuming the numbers, assuming the numbers come out where they look like they're going to come out. We're going to rock along with another legislature that's going to say, you know, some people are going to talk a good game. Will Stapp's going to get in there and say, I'm a fiscal conservative, by gosh, I'm going to cut spending. Oh, my God. Wait, wait, wait. You want to tax the top 20 percent? Uh, in order to, to pay for it, in order to hold up. No, 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 I don't want that. I'll agree. I'll agree to give you your spending if you agree not to tax uh, either my top 20 percent or the or the old companies. We're just going to rock along with with legislators um, uh, like that yet again. Um, and uh, and and we're not going to solve anything. So all of the hopes and dreams of, the, of this uh, of this campaign, of this election cycle, really giving us a, a, a solid result that we could go forward with. Um, I just don't think that's going to I just don't think well, that's going to happen. And what's really interesting about some of these so-called round hill Republicans you're talking about is, I mean, at least with Shower and some of the others, they addressed, you know, every option of it. I mean, that included, you know, uh, taxes, but also, you know, increasing the taxes on the oil company and other things. And a lot of these these, you know, top 20 percent Republicans. They don't want any of that. They want they don't want anything to be messed with the oil industry. I mean, there's money on the table there. There's hundreds of millions of dollars that could be, you know, it could be scooped up and used, but they don't want to do that. So they don't want to, A, uh, they don't want to stop the PFD gravy train, and they don't want to increase or change any of the tax structures around the oil companies. And that, so that's like the double whammy there. It is. It is. And what do you end up with? You end up with, the, I mean, it, that's how we got into this coalition. We got into the coalition because Kelly Merrick said, if you agree not to tax the oil companies, if you agree not to tax the top 20%, I'll, I'll join your coalition and I'll vote for for the spending uh, uh, spending that, uh, that that you want to do. As long as you don't tax my people, uh, I'll go along with whatever, whatever spending you want to do. And that's that's where we're going to end up. I mean, Steve Thompson and Bart LeBond didn't join the coalition, but that's where they were. I mean, on 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 the tough votes, if there would have been tough votes on those issues, that's where they were going to be. Uh, that's where we ended up with people in the Senate, like Gary Stevens and and Stedman and 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 people in the Republican side in the Senate. When it came to the tough votes, they crossed over and they and they formed effectively budget coalitions uh, with uh, with the minority, with the Democrats uh, uh, when, in this last session. I, you just don't. You, you, there, there's there's not going to be any change to that. The play the faces may change some. Um, <laughs> and as I say, some of the old old faces may come back. Diesel may come back, uh, the, but the faces may change some. But the, there's not a clarity out there on the issues. If you if you have Chris Tuck talking about vote for Andy Josephson, he's going to look out for working Alaska families. Vote for Les Gear, they're going to look out for Alaska families. 
both for Maxine Dilbert. She's going to, they're going to look out for Alaska families. And then you look at the positions they're taking. They're not looking out for Alaska families. They're looking out for a different constituency. They're looking out for government spending. Um, and, and, and we're just, you know, and that's where we're going to be. So right. I, it's, so, it's, a, it's a disappointment that that's, that that's where we've gotten to in this election. So your thought is the election's not going to solve anything. We may have coalitions in both the house and the Senate and the governor may be able to stop stuff, but he's not going to be able to drive the agenda. Is that kind of the conciseness of the whole thing? Yeah, it is. It is. And, and, and you're exactly right on the governor able to stop stuff without majorities. I mean, we have to keep in mind, continually keep in mind the PFD set by the legislature, the governor has very little to do with it. And without majorities in working that he can work with in, in both the house and the Senate, because uh, it takes both bodies agreeing to it, without majorities he can work with, uh, he's not going to be able to accomplish uh, what he's proposed to accomplish on the PFD. So we're going to end up, you know, we're going to end up in the same place of of the governor trying to use what 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 leverage he has, sort of, uh, to to extract a higher PFD uh, and just go from year to year to year. We're not going to we're not going to get uh, these issues uh, resolved uh, for the long term. Uh, Brad Keithley, our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Number two, it's all about legacy, the lame duck, right? I mean, uh, Dunleavy, if he gets in, he's going to be building a legacy. Um, maybe even Lisa, because if Frank Choice voting gets out of the way, I don't think she'll ever make it back there again. So is she lame duck? Is is it all about legacy? And what does that mean to you? Well, here's here's the question that I'm that I'm I wonder about. Assuming Dunleavy gets reelected, and the polls are telling us that's going to happen. Assuming Dunleavy gets reelected, he's in he's in a lame duck situation, right? He can't he can't run for a third term. Um, Jay Hammond uh, produced the PFD um, and 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 effectively used his power as governor during uh, during his final term in office, during his second term in office, to produce the PFD. Is Dunleavy, the question I've got is, is Dunleavy now freed of the need to run for re-election? Is he going to be a stronger leader than he has been the last four years when I, when frankly, I think he was just trying to survive to get to the election and then survive through the election. Is he going to think about in his second term, is he going to think about leaving a legacy for future Alaskans in the same way that that Hammond, that Hammond thought about it. And is he going to use the power of the governorship as, as Hammond did in his second term? Is he going to use the power of the governorship uh, to build a legacy? Or is Dunleavy going to sit there and go, if I rock along another four years and either we do away with ranked choice voting or we don't, assuming Lisa gets elected to the Senate, am I going to rock along four years and am I going to think about running against Lisa um, in six years? And, and so... Once again, as governor for these next four years, I don't want to do anything that really perturbs anybody. Uh, I just want to sort of keep rocking along and, and, you know, talk a good game about being a conservative, get to the end of my term. And then assuming Lisa has been reelected and assuming Lisa's the senator, sit there and really run for two years uh, for, for that Senate seat. I, I think there's I think there is a choice there. I hope he decides that he wants to leave a legacy as governor. I hope like Hammond in his second term, he says he wants to, he wants to do something that, uh, that, that he leaves behind something that's lasting. I can only hope that Dunleavy will want to leave a legacy of some kind. Um, I mean, really, well, the problem is, is going back to number one, he's not going to have a legislature to support him. So it's going to be very tough to create some kind of long lasting legacy. If you've got, if you have this adversarial relationship, where basically you're doing nothing but combat with the legislature the entire time and holding them back, it's going to be pretty tough to create some kind of legacy, don't you think? Yeah, it's, it's, there's going to be a challenge. I mean, I think stepping back, I think the fiscal policy working group uh, uh, outline of last year, God, that was just last year, seems like longer ago, but the fiscal policy working group of last year is, 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 is a good outline of where we, of where we need to get. Um, the governor really never fully endorsed it um, and never really pressed for it. Uh, and it just sort of died in that, in that, in the legislative session that, that followed it coming out. But you had people like Ben Carpenter on one side and Jesse Keel on the other side uh, uh, coming together and agreeing on, on a set of terms that would resolve. I mean, it, it would be compromised on all sides, but it would resolve 
uh, Alaska's fiscal situation, get it behind us and, and, and let us talk about other things and talk about, you know, policies moving forward. Um, and, and I think that if the governor, if, if he's elected with the legislature, as, as we just talked about, that's, that's, you know, uh, uh, opposed to him on, on both sides or, or in coalitions on both sides, I think if the governor came out and fully endorsed the fiscal policy working group proposal and said, this is the, this is the baseline that we're going to use. Let's all sit down. Let's have a series of meetings. Let's see if we can't, if we can't hammer it out. I think that would, that would give him a chance, give the state a chance of being able to, to resolve the situation. Um, but it takes, I, it, nobody's going to go out, and, and try to do leadership on that, or nobody's going to be successful in doing leadership on that if the governor's not on board. Because what, what do you do? You, you, you sort of set all this up, and then the governor, just like, just like, the, just like the vaping tax, right? Just to, just to give you something to get, you know, to get your blood going again. You, you, you pass the vaping tax, the e-cigarette tax, and then the governor vetoes it. So nobody's going nobody's gonna to spend a whole lot of time trying to bring all of this together if at the end of the day, the governor is going to veto it. Um, so it's, or, or pick pieces and parts of it, you know, pick apart the, 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 the compromise of it. So I think, I think the chance for his legacy, if he wants to establish a legacy is, is to sort of endorse the fiscal policy working group, say Ben Carpenter, you on the right, you've already signed off on this. Jesse Keel, you on the left, you've already signed off on this. Let's bring everybody together and let's, let's, Let's hammer out the details of how of how this is going to work, um, and I think there's a chance to be able to accomplish that. But the governor's got to do it. I mean, the governor's got to step up and do it. He's got to uh, drive. He's got to drive the boat on that. He's he's got to be the one leading the charge on it. Yeah, he can't be sitting there in the background going, "Yeah, you're gonna pass all that stuff, and then I'll veto it, and then I'll you know look like." And so and so the governor's got to make up his, to me. The governor's got to make up his mind whether that's what he wants to do, whether he wants to leave a legacy of having resolved this stuff like Hammond resolved the PFD in his second term. The governor's got to make up his mind whether he wants to resolve this stuff and leave a strong fiscal legacy for the future or whether he wants to sort of do what he did the last four years and just sort of rock along because he's thinking he can't run again for governor, but because he's thinking if Lisa's sitting out there in six years again, six years again, six years again that that he wants to position himself to uh to be able to to do yeah. that and and he doesn't want to rock the boat while he's while he's sitting around uh while he's getting ready to do that brad i don't think this was your intention today but uh geez brad such a debbie downer with that outlook and nothing changing why vote i think i'll just stay home today i don't think that was your point here in in this right here i think everybody needs to go vote but i mean we need to be realistic too right well, we do need to be realistic, and 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 frankly, if if you live in I don't know where Scott lives, but if you if you live in Mike Showers district, this is the reason to go vote, because if you let Doug Massey, if you don't go vote for Shower and you let Doug Massey get elected, it's it's going to be even worse. I mean, the legislature is going to be even more tilted against the PFD and even more tilted against uh, against fiscal policies that that work for uh, middle and lower income Alaska families. So. Um, it, it, no, actually, actually, if you, if you live in one of those districts, Mia Costello, uh, Mia Costello and, uh, and Matt Clayman's district, if you live in one of those districts where, where there's still a chance of getting a, a, a true fiscal conservative, uh, elected, it's, it's all the more reason to go vote because we don't want to abandon, uh, any of, and any more of those races, lose any more of those races right. to the other side. Geisel Holland, if you live in that district, it's a reason to go vote. Uh, to try to you know keep the the core uh, fiscal conservatives uh, as strong as it can be. We're continuing now, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We were just talking about um, legacy and Dunleavy um, in his lame duck session. Assuming that he is reelected, what does he do? Does he go Katie bar the door? Does he go for broke? And try and fulfill a lot of the promises he originally ran on. Does he, you know, does he, does he make waves, or does he sit back and relax because he's really got his eye on the Senate seat uh, in the future? I mean, I guess a lot of that depends on whether or not Murkowski actually wins, and there's a chance that uh, Shabaka could win. 
And so I guess that is really kind of the the coin toss on this one, right, Brad? I mean, that's really that's, in the long run. That's really another reason to vote for Kelly. To, to I, exactly, exactly. Sort of, sort of seal off Dunleavy so all he's got left is legacy. Um, I, I really I really hope the governor uh, comes through this election and says, okay, you know, we recovered from the first year. We recovered from the recall push. We, we, we got through these four years. Um, I don't have the kind of legislature that I, that, that is perfect for me, but, uh, but by gosh, like Hammond in his second term, I wonder how many times I can repeat that on the show, like, like, like Hammond in, in his second term, I want to leave a legacy. I want to leave something that Alaskans remember me for sort of unlike Tony Knowles in his second term, which was just sort of, you know, he got through another, he got through another four years like Hammond in his second term. Uh, I want to leave a legacy that, you know, 20 years from now, 40 years from now, 50 years from now, a hundred years from now, Alaskans remembered, remember the Dunleavy, the second Dunleavy administration for finally bringing a solution to Alaska's long-term fiscal issues, set the stage for, for growth, for certainty, fiscal certainty and for growth, uh, growth beyond that. I, if, if, if I were the governor and I'm not, but if I were the governor, that is, that is the kind of thing that I would think about a lot uh, for my second term. The things I would want to accomplish that left that legacy, that long-term legacy for the second term. Now, I, you know, if 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 Murkowski wins, the Senate seat sitting out there in six years, uh, that may be something that's just you know that his advisors and others say you got to position yourself to go for. Don't rock the waves. Don't don't do anything that 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 creates an issue. Uh, between now and then, but but it's I, I I am hopeful that when the governor sits there, that he's gonna he's gonna sit there and say I want to accomplish things in this in these last four years that that leave a legacy. Now, as as we were just talking about, as you just pointed out, there's an inconsistency between that saying that and the first point we were talking about with the leg, which with the legislature still going to be mush. But as we talked about in the break, I think. I think the way to reconcile that is for the governor to adopt the fiscal policy working group uh, results of a year ago and say, look, we have a framework here. This is this is where Ben Carpenter on the right, Jesse Keel on the left, all came together. They agreed this is something that that would that could set policy that they could all chip in on and set policy going forward. And I think that sets the stage for the governor picking that up and saying, OK, we're going to resolve this, folks. Here's the here's here's the here's the way forward that that this this broad bipartisan bicameral group agreed on. Most of them are still around. Let's get together. I'm going to drive this boat, and I'm going to tell you if we come out with something along those lines, I'm going to sign it. Right. Um, and and I think I think that I think he can use that as a way of dri driving toward a legacy. But you know the question the questions in the air uh, whether he'll do that or not. Well, the question is, would he be electable? If um, he continues on the same milk toast route that he's been going on, I mean, even if he does nothing over the next four years and then decides to run for Murkowski's seat, if she gets reelected, well, that's great, except for people already feel stung and they feel cheated. And if he does nothing to wow them between now and then, what, you know, what is, is that make him any more palatable than before? I mean, that that's a whole nother aspect of this. Well, he got reelected this time. <laughs> I mean, it looks like he's going to be reelected this time. So right. he can say, you know, if I just if I muddle through the way I did these last four years, uh, I'll be I'll still be electable. There, there's a lot of things that can change. Certainly, if Murkowski's reelected, there's a lot of things that can change in six years. Other candidates can emerge. Other forces can emerge. I mean, it, it can really, you know, the dynamics can shift a lot. But but Dunleavy's got statewide name recognition. He certainly likes talking about national issues on Fox News and elsewhere. Um, and and he's, you know, and he, I can see him uh, thinking that he can position himself uh, to right. do that. But but if he does that, if that's what if that's what his thought process is, they're going to look at the last four years as the template for how to accomplish that, for how to make him electable. And that is talk a good game, but not really, you know, pitch in and, and and deal with these issues, get in the middle of these issues, and work out solutions like Hammond did. He's gonna he's gonna you know lay back and and just sort of let uh, let things float along and and just sort of you know keep talking about national issues and 
being the national spokesman on oil issues and that sort of stuff. Let's move on to number three. Is the Alaska LNG project any closer to actual fruition? Is it really, is it here? Is it any closer this time? So here's the here's the interesting thing about that. I mean, a lot of people dismiss the the summit over in Tokyo as a campaign stunt uh, designed by Dan Sullivan to help support uh, Dunleavy's reelection. I don't think it was. And the reason I don't is Rahm Emanuel, if there's any more Democrat, more election savvy than, than Rahm Emanuel, I'm not sure who it is. Um, uh, Rahm Emanuel, uh, the ambassador to Japan, was the one who called. Uh, the LNG summit, the one who chaired the LNG summit, the, the administration spokesman on it, uh, the, the, the administration spokesman who was pushing Alaska LNG. Here's, here's what I think's going on. If you look at the world realignment that's going on in light of, the, of Russia's Ukraine invasion, uh, the West is sort of going to supply itself. The East, Russia is going to supply China um, and Russia is going to uh, supply, looks like, India. Uh, and other uh, Asian nations, but but the West is going to sort of find ways to take care of itself. Japan is sort of sitting out there um, uh, un, unhinged or or adrift right now. Japan's imports from Russia, the value of Japan's imports from Russia, actually have gone up since the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine. And the reason it has is it's continued to import LNG uh, from uh, uh, from Russia. Uh, and paid higher prices for it uh, uh, coming from Russia. So Japan's balance of trade with Russia has actually gotten worse since uh, since Ukraine. The West doesn't, uh, the Biden administration, people in the United States, people in Europe don't want that. They want Japan on side, uh, on the West side uh, in, in the split as the world sort of realigns. So from a national security standpoint, there there is a, there is a strong reason to get U.S. LNG, to get other sources of LNG into Japan. It doesn't look like Australia is going to be able to, to pick up that slack. Uh, the U.S. Gulf Coast is being redirected largely to Europe. So it, it, you, you need an addition to, to get Japan unhooked off of Russian LNG. You need, an, it looks like you need an additional supply of LNG coming into Japan. And Alaska certainly fits that. It's on it's on the, the Pacific Ocean, doesn't have to go through the Panama Canal. Uh, shipping costs are lower. Um, and, and because our gas is stranded, uh, the economics of it look better. I mean, it's not competing. No one else is trying to buy our gas. So, so it's, the price isn't being driven up by that. It's susceptible to a long-term uh, market agreement. And, and so I, there, there is a strong case for, for why it's different this time. And the fact that you had a pre-election chaired by Rahm Emanuel uh, uh, a conference on a, focused on Alaska LNG, I think is an indicator that it may be different this time. Now, it may not be natural gas. LNG or Alaska LNG is shifting, uh, has recently started a hydrogen uh, 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 program and, and, and talking about turning in, uh, uh, turning the Cook Inlet into a hydrogen hub. Uh, turning uh, uh, natural gas into uh, Alaska's natural gas into hydrogen and shipping it as hydrogen, and and Japan's talked about using that as a fuel. So it may not be it may not be in the form of LNG, but it may be using Alaska's gas, Alaska's uh, 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 natural gas molecules, it, turning it into a different form of energy and shipping it over to Japan. I think it is different, but it is a different situation than 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 we've had before. Um, in part because of the invasion um, and in part because of the ability to, uh, to fix uh, costs on the Alaska side in a way you can't do it with the Gulf Coast and in a way that you really can't do it with Australia either. I think this is good news for us. The question is, you know, what does it mean in the long term for, I mean, these are all long term projects. These don't happen. We don't just, you know, wave a magic wand and say, okay, now we're producing LNG. This has got a long lead time on it. So what do you think? I mean, when do we know whether or not this is really happening in your mind? Oh, two years, three years. I mean, a lot's got to happen between now and then. A lot's got to happen in terms of fiscal, financial commitments, contracts from Japanese companies uh, with uh, uh, for uh, LNG. We've got to find the funding uh, for, uh, uh, for, the, for the pipeline, whether it's hydrogen or 
or natural gas, it's got to be piped down to the Cook Inlet, uh, one way or the other. Um, so we've got to find we got to find funding for that. Uh, but it's it's a different project. When you say we're farther along now than we ever ever been before, I'm not sure that's a fair. I'm not sure that's a fair statement. We're in a different project now than than we've been before. We're in a different environment now than we've been before. And 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 we're looking differently as a result of being in that different environment and with that with that different with that different project. Things have to fall in place. Uh, Japan has to make uh, commitments, purchase commitments of of the product. We have to find financing for the kit, for the fi- for the pipeline, for for either the hydrogenation plant or the liquefaction plant, whatever it turns out to be. Uh, we have to do a lot of things. Have to get a lot of things uh, resolved. But it's but it's a it's a path that, especially given uh, the administration's support, especially given you know the, the the heightened awareness of it that the administration's giving it uh, with uh, with the conference over in Tokyo, uh, it's a path that looks promising um, uh, in a way that sort of the old LNG pre Russia pre pre the invasion of the, the Ukraine it looked like the U.S. Gulf Coast was going to have enough gas that Russia was going to continue to supply Europe that the U.S. Gulf Coast was going to be uh, Asian-oriented and it was going to have enough gas to supply Asia. With the with the reconfiguration that's going on in the world uh, as a result of the Russian invasion, the world looks a lot different. The, the, the LNG, the energy world looks a lot different. Um, and so I think, there's, I think there is uh, an opportunity there for Alaska LNG that's different than it's been before um, and sort of unique to Alaska LNG. Before we were just competing with the Gulf Coast for it to be another supplier. But but given the geopolitical realignment um, and given you know some, some advantages that Alaska has in the Cook Inlet in terms of being able to store CO2 as part of the hydrogenation process, I, 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 I there's a difference in this project that 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 has some appeal to it. And of course, <clears throat> one of the big questions with this is uh, locked in gas, there is a cost. Uh, and it's a fixed cost, and it's pretty high compared to many of the other fields. But you're saying that those fields are in demand for other players, so this may be the only option at that point. Or, well, yeah. So, yeah. so the Gulf Coast looks like it's 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 U.S. Gulf Coast looks like it's going to be a supplier to to Europe uh, over the long term, not just over the medium term. But but if Europe's going to disconnect from Russia, they're going to need supplies from someplace. Africa will be part of it. Qatar will be part of it, but the U.S. Gulf Coast will be a big part of it. Um, and then, and then there's a uniqueness to uh, to Alaska's ability to uh, uh, positioning to to supply Asia. So there, there's a reason. It was not. Let me let me say this. It was not a re-election stunt designed. Rahm Emanuel was not part of a re-election stunt designed to re-elect Dunleavy. That was that. That is not what that was. It was something else, and it, it was, I think, the first step or the first public um, uh, recognition of a different project that, uh, that, that has some attractiveness to it. Brett Keithley, <clears throat> Alaska's for Sustainable Budgets. Final thoughts here on Election Day. What's your, what's your words of encouragement here now that you've beaten the crap out of us for 40 minutes? Well, let me go, let me go back to, to the comment we had in the last break that – Vote. I mean, we need all the fiscal conservatives we can get. If you're in Showers di- District, if you're in, um, uh, if you're in Roger Hall and Kathy Geisels, if you if you're in Mia Costello, uh, Matt Clayman, if you're down on the Valley uh, in one of the districts, one of the competitive districts where you've got a fiscal conservative versus a round heel Republican, um, uh, vote. My gosh. I mean, we need all, we need all of the fiscal conservatives. I guess the point is we're not going to have enough to take over. It doesn't look like we're going to win enough races to uh, to have a majority, but by gosh, we need all of them we can get. So get out there and vote uh, and, and, and give, get, get us enough uh, to, uh, to continue to, uh, to, to have that position be a player uh, in the discussion. If all those people get wiped out, if Shower gets wiped out, if Holland gets wiped out, um, if Mia gets wiped out, if people in, uh, down on the down on the peninsula get wiped out of people up in the valley. The, the 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 true fiscal conservatives get wiped out. If all those people get wiped out, we're not even we're not even going to have a voice um, in in continuing to pursue uh, the PFD and other fiscally conservative issues. So 
Yeah. Oh my gosh. Get out and vote. It's, it's imperative. <clears throat> Absolutely important. Brad, thank you. Yeah. Bra uh, G Gary Stevens is another one. The click Bishop, Elijah Verhagen race. I mean, those are all races that we should be getting out there and voting and bringing a friend with us when we come. Um, all right, Brad Keithley, <clears throat> Alaskans uh, for Sustainable Ledgers. Thank you, my friend, for coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.